is with Frank Mack. Uh, Frank is here on June 24th, 2011 for the uh, annual, not annual, but semi-annual Mack Family Reunion that's held every two years. This is Frank's e second interview for the museum. He's going to tell us some more stories about his growing up in Mooresville, but he's also going to tell us again the story of how the Mack family came to be in Mooresville. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Uh, well, the way we got here, my granddaddy came across the ocean from Lebanon, went through Ellis Island. Uh, some friends in New York met him when he got off the, the ferry from uh, Ellis Island. He couldn't speak English, so they put a tag on his vest that said, put him off in Marion, South Carolina. Well, there were friends from the, uh, Lebanon that my granddaddy wanted to go stay with and get accustomed to the customs of America and become an American. So during that time, they put him on a train south. Well, the train, as it came south, crossed into North Carolina and the conductor started going, Marion, North Carolina, Marion, North Carolina. He just heard the word Marion and he got up, got off the train, went into the station. He was one of the few that, that got off. Everybody else that got off knew where they were going. He went over and sat on a bench to wait on his friends to come get him, not realizing he was one state away from where he needed to be. Well, back in those days, the train didn't come through every five minutes, and there was no way to get anywhere else. He sat on a bench in the station at Mary, North Carolina, until the station master was going to close it up at 6 o'clock. Now, I doubt this would ever happen today, but back then, the station master went over to him, he couldn't understand him, but he knew he wasn't going to sit there all night. He had to close the station up. He took him home with him, fed him dinner, put, put him in the bed for the night. The next morning, he took him back to the station. There was a train going to Charlotte, and the station master knew of some Arabic-speaking people across from the depot on Trade Street in Charlotte. They were the Josephs, and they had a cafe and uh, a, a grocery store, but they also ordered the stuff in wholesale and then retailed it in their grocery store. So he put a note on my granddaddy's vest that said, you know, call the Josephs across the street at the cafe, and they'll be able to understand, you know, what he's doing, where he's going. Uh, the station master then telegraphed to say, I'm sending this guy down, he can't speak English, but you can take care of it, it's on his vest. So once he met the Josephs, they begged him to just stay. It was a great region, it was growing. They said that they got bought stuff wholesale, and he could buy it from just a little over wholesale and then take it out and peddle it. And my granddaddy would actually bundle up different kinds of stuff, uh, tablecloths, knives, aprons, just all kinds of stuff. And he would put them in these packs and physically carry them. And he would walk up old, what is now old uh, 115. But he would walk up and he would stop at a farmhouse. And of course, eventually he got to where he could speak English. And he became like the bearer of, of the news. And so people really wanted him to stop. Uh, he did that for a couple of years and then went back to Lebanon, hoping to bring the rest of the family over. My grandmother did not want to leave, so they, he brought my dad, Charles, and my Aunt Nora. And they came back, they opened up a little side shop and sold stuff. Frank, what time frame were we talking about? What year was it? Uh, well, he came time? to this country in 19, I want to say, 9 or 10. Okay. Okay? Uh, let's see, 9 or 10. Yeah, about 9 or 10. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, well, it might have been a little earlier than that. Then he went back. He was gone a year and a half. And then he came back 
And when he came back, he brought my dad, Charles, and my aunt, Nora. Nora stayed in the shop and sold retail to whoever bought in. Dad and my granddaddy would walk their route. And uh, I remember my dad telling me, and I found it funny when he told me this was probably in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, and we, we were going down 115, and he pointed to a house on the other side of the railroad tracks, and they had an airplane hangar there. And he said, you see that house? I said, yeah. He said, your granddaddy and I, every time we would come up, first of all, we were, thought we were in high cotton because we owned a horse and a buggy by, or a wagon. We would spend the night at that house, and they always welcomed us in. They would feed us dinner, put us up for the night. But yet we would tell them all the news that we got in Charlotte and whatever. And then we would go on and we would probably do another 15, maybe 20 miles. But we stopped at various farms and sold some of our goods. And again, everybody wanted news of what was happening. And they would just make a big circle. And then years later, uh, my, well, year, three years later, my dad was 14 years old. He went back across the ocean to bring the family. Uh, without his knowledge, Uncle Side, his brother, older brother, and two men from the same town that they were from in Lebanon decided they're tired of waiting on d dad or granddaddy to send them, you know, walking papers basically come on over. So they left on their own and uh, came to this country. So my dad passed my uncle on the ocean somewhere and didn't didn't know that he was here. So when he got to Lebanon, he found out that just three sisters and his mother was there. Well, his mother still didn't want to come and so he stayed. And when he turned 18, he was still there. He had met a, a lady there. He got married. Her name was Farida. And uh, his mother still didn't want to leave, so they just sort of stayed, uh, you know, and, and he got little jobs to do and, and all that. Well, the house they lived in was a three-story house, which a lot of the old houses were like that. The first level was really like a basement, or in this case, it was like a, a little menagerie. They kept goats and, and a couple sheep in there for meal and to butcher uh, occasionally. And the second floor was the dining room, the living room, and the kitchen. And when my grandmother would cook and stuff, she would take the scraps and throw it over the rail down to the goats and the, the sheep. Uh, by the way, the third third floor of the house held the bedrooms. And it was all concrete, so it was cool. And it, it, again, in the mountainous region, it got fairly chilly over there. But one day she went to feed the goats and the, the sheep, and she slipped, fell, went over the rail, hit the concrete, broke her neck, and died. Uh, with that, my dad saw the opportunity to bring the rest of the family. So he packed up three sisters, a wife. They came back to this country, um, settled in Charlotte for a while, and then World War I broke out, and he moved to Lawrence, Massachusetts, and worked in the shipyard in Lawrence uh, during World War I. Uh, Your grandfather was still in Charlotte. My grandfather was still in Charlotte. And at this time, uh, Philip, my next to the oldest brother, was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And after the war, they came back and settled in Morrison. And uh, he ran... Um, by then, my grandfather had switched mostly to dry goods, uh, suits, coats, shirts, that kind of thing. Uh, and my uncle side and my grandfather, and this, uh, some people may remember John Mack and son, uh, 
Uh, the reason it was named John Lincoln Sons came from a grandfather and his oldest son side. And they would actually carry, in fact, uh, at the 50th anniversary of John Lincoln's son, Uncle Si broke out the packs that he carried. He carried one over this shoulder, which hung out about like this, one over this shoulder, and then he had another one that went on his back, and a strap came around and went across his forehead, and he sort of just leaned into it, and that's, he walked from house to house. I mean, I've had people in Salisbury when I was delivering for the for the stores look at me and go, oh, you're Mr. Charlie's son. Well, yeah, well, I can remember when he used to walk through here and bring us this and that. So I, I, all the stories my dad told me sort of verified, but some of the old timers that I ran into, as I mean, I was 14, 15 years old at the time. I mean, I couldn't even drive. I was riding on the truck to make deliveries, and I helped the driver carry stuff in. And I remember going into this one store outside of, uh, it was actually between uh, Moxville and, and Salisbury. They had an old pot bellied stove in the back, and all these old guys sitting around in overhauls, you know, with the straps that come over. And they were sitting around on Coke crates and orange crates, and they, were just, they just sat there and shot the breeze. They didn't really have anything else to do. And we would go in, and that's when, you know, you'd start hearing these stories. Uh, and one guy told me, he says, you know, I've always admired your dad. He's the most honest guy I've ever known. And I looked at him, and, you know, you got to imagine I'm 15, so it's not like, you know, I'm the wisest man in the world. And uh, I looked at him very quizzically, and he, he said, one time when they delivered here, they sh sh took a nickel too much, a nickel, mind you, too much. He made a special trip from Louisville back here to bring that nickel back, mm -hmm. which, you know, it just, could, it just tells you how honest and trustworthy he was. <clears throat> but that's that's basically how we settled here. Uh, my dad <coughs> bought the house on Center Street uh, in the 1920s. It was actually built in 1912, and I by Mr. Perry, who lived in the house. And when my dad came back from uh, uh, Lawrence, he had a, a son Theodore and a son Philip. And so they settled into that house. And uh, in, in fact, this year that house is on a historical tour. Um, I've talked to the, the present owner who is very much into old houses and antiques and just loves the house and told her how the house sort of evolved from the 1920s to what it is currently. And, um, you know, I, in 1948, they did a major remodeling on it, and it was my mom's influence who came from Cuba. Uh, she came with a sister from Lebanon to this country, and at the time, the U.S. had closed down immigration. So she and her sister went to, uh, and I think her, her younger brother, to Cuba and became Cuban citizens literally of 13 years. In the meantime, my dad's first wife became ill, died. He had four boys. The youngest one was Lewis. He was four years old when my mother and dad married. And, and they got to know each other sort of in a, a, an arranged marriage. Uh, cousins in South Carolina told dad about these two young women that were from a, a town that was no more than a mile away from them in Lebanon. And that, you know, she would make a good mother, and she was in Cuba and wanted to come to this country. So they ended up getting married, and of course that was in 1936. And I came along, and then John came along, and I think Mom had a, a daughter ahead of me that died. But Lewis, you know, became her four-year-old son. And it was really funny because in most households here, everybody spoke English. In our household, 
my dad and all the boys spoke Arabic, all our relatives spoke Arabic. My mom lived in Cuba for 13 years. She didn't speak English, she could speak Arabic, and she could speak Spanish. So the only way we communicated in the house was by using Arabic. And I can remember at the age of four going to the front door, and I, I learned English from the neighborhood. Uh, but going to the front door, the full brush man was there, and he would explain what he was trying to sell my mom. I would turn around, and I still can't believe I did this, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And I would translate to my mom in Arabic. And she would either buy or not buy. Sometimes she'd buy a brush or a broom or something she thought she needed. And, uh, I mean, that, that was the way it grew up. Uh, later on, she got more fluent in English. Then she got her citizenship. She got her driver's license. And, oh, God help the hedges. <laughs> she, she had uh, a few, few bouts, but at least she became part of the community. And my dad was still alive, although he worked, you know, five, six days a week most of the time. My mom and Alice Bistany, my mom was uh, made uh, negligees and drapes and that kind of stuff. I mean, really fine uh, artistic work in Cuba. And uh, so when she came to this country, she always wanted to do some kind of business. And what she knew, she just had a knack for decorating and a green thumb. I mean, I've seen her go into the Fountain Blue Hotel when it was first opened in Miami Beach. We were just on a tour. We knew one of the chefs there. And we were going in with his wife, and it was Taylor Lowrance, who was from Morsel. And he was the egg chef. And I'll never forget standing in the back of the kitchen and watching him with two spatulas doing sunny side eggs. And he would just go down the line of the grill flipping or over easy and sunny side up or whatever. Had another guy doing scrambled eggs. He didn't touch omelets or scrambled eggs. He only did sunny side up or over easy or medium. And they had another guy doing bacon. I mean, it was amazing. But go on the way in, or maybe the way out, they had these huge beds of all kinds of floor. Mom saw a couple things she liked, leaned over and broke a stem off and put it in her pocketbook. Most people, that's, I mean, there's no way they're going to get that to grow. She had a palm tree growing in our backyard. I swear it was four feet high when she cut it down. But I mean, she, you know, she got into the garden club and, and was, you know, noted for some of the, the plants that she grew. But she started owl sets with Alice Bistany, the two Alices, and they started doing drapes and, and home decorating, and she got in with some of the furniture companies, so she could go to your house to decorate your house and say, uh, well, you know, you need this kind of furniture and this kind of furniture, and if they said, yeah, where do I get it? She would order it for them. Number one, it saved them money because she didn't have the overhead of a store. And number two, it really fit and made the room. And then they would do uh, <coughs> the lamp, the lamp, you know, the wooden things that went over windows back then that was padded and, and done in one of the colors of the drapes. And then she would do drapes, and they hung a lot of shears in them. And, I mean, she just had a knack for that kind of stuff. And uh, God bless her, she did that up until she couldn't function anymore as, uh, you know, it's just, she'd gotten too old and too feeble. And, uh, of course, Dad uh, lived and worked. Uh, <coughs> he was only 5'7", but I used to say he was the fastest man on two feet because he would walk to the store a lot of times, which from our house on Center Street, it was mostly uphill to to the store. His little short legs, I had to run about every fifth step to keep up with him. I mean, he was used to walking in Lebanon, 
he was used to walking and pedaling. I mean, I guess when they pedaled and went from house to house, they didn't let the grass grow under their feet. I mean, they were moving. But I, I just, I, I could not keep up with him. And we, we would get to the store, and he'd be breathing like he's been sitting in an easy chair, and I'd be puffing. I mean, here I was, you know, back then I was probably about 12 years old. He used to pay me like, instead of giving me an allowance, he'd give me 50 cents or a quarter to do uh, stack candy or, you know, in the candy room or out, you know, they had to take it out of the case and stack it up so they could fill the orders. And uh, it, it, that was great because I'm not afraid to work today. Unfortunately, I'm not in the physical shape I can do any, but uh, all along I've held at least one job, sometimes two. If there was something I wanted to do, like I wanted to go hunt in Alaska, and uh, my buddy and I were saving up, I got a job in a convenience store, and I'd go to work at WBTV at 5 in the morning, or I'd leave at 5. We'd do the 6 o'clock news in the morning, we do the 7.15 cut in, the 7.30 cut in, excuse me, 7 o'clock cut in, 7.30 cut in. And then I would go do the Betty Feaser show or some commercials or whatever. And usually, except on Wednesday, I would get off about 1.30 or 2 o'clock. And I would leave there and go to this convenience store and work until 7.30. And then I'd go home and start the day over. But uh, on Wednesday nights, I was a director of wrestling. The Crockett's would come in and we'd set up their ring. And, and uh, you know, people used to always say, oh, that's fake. Nobody gets into that. Well, let me tell you, some of the guys that were on the floor crew when I first started on the floor crew said, oh, man, we're going to end up having to, to wipe up where somebody wet their pants. And I'm looking at them, because they, they didn't allow drinks or food in the studio. I said, you got to be kidding. Nobody gets excited about that stuff. Oh, yeah. Sure enough, we would go to slide the bleachers back, and here comes the guy with the mop bucket. I mean, it, it was unbelievable. These wrestlers had people that followed them from event to event to event. And the Crockett's would always, Big Jim Crockett was a great promoter. And he would give out tickets, but he would give one or two short to some of the groupies. Well, those groupies didn't come by themselves. They always brought people. So just for a TV taping, we would probably put in the bleachers and on folding chairs about 125 to 130 people. And, of course, the main room was right there. We had camera angles on two sides and an elevated camera, and we would do that, and I became the director of that. And let's, let, let's make sure everybody understands that you were a cameraman. I, originally, I was a cameraman, but I, I was promoted to a, a director, mm -hmm. which directed programming at WBTV. And so I, I sat there and I pushed the buttons and I did the slides and I put up the name slides over this newsman or that newsman or I would tell, I'd yell into the, our director's chairs and, and board were upstairs with the audio guy. The videotape and the film chains where they put up slides in, in 16 millimeter film were downstairs. So you had an intercom system. And you had to know that when you yelled for a certain piece of film footage that news had shot, it was immediate. Once he hit the button, it came on. Whereas if it was on a videotape, there was a five-second delay. So from the time I sat into the speaker, roll tape, I had to sit there and doing other things and count to five before I would switch to it. Otherwise, I got a black screen. And if you ever watch TV and see a black screen, you know somebody screwed up, and that, that's a no-no. But anyway, I, I worked there. Um, at the time I started at WBTV, I lived in Charlotte, in the Morsel, drove back and forth every day. I bought an old 53 Chevrolet that I called JC for just a car. 
and it had no air conditioning. It had a radio that might work sometimes and might not work. But my other car was a 1967 Corvette, and this was 68, and I wasn't about to drive it because the rocks were flipping up and chipping paint. And so I left it in the garage in Morrisville, and I would drive back and forth. And uh, till I got married, I bought a house in Charlotte, moved to Charlotte, and uh, uh, what a pain. I mean, uh, you know, I, when I was in Morrisville growing up, I always said, wouldn't it be great to grow up somewhere like Charlotte? Well, I've been there and done that now. And I'm going to tell you, Morrisville, when I grew up anyway, and, and forgive me for getting emotional, <clears throat> was a great place to grow up. I mean, I didn't even get a door key to our house until I was in college. And the reason I got it then was in case my mom had gone out of town somewhere. And I, I came home and we just didn't connect. Uh, it, it, it was just great. You could go anywhere in town. I mean, I remember one time Jimmy Good and myself, we, we were in the ninth grade, um, yeah, the ninth grade, we used to go to Davidson. There was a, a barber shop with several black guys in it that cut great flat tops. And Jimmy and I both had flat tops that were to die for. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't get a ride down to get our haircuts. And we needed, it was getting longer than we wanted them. And we got on our bikes and rode the seven miles down to the barber shop, got haircuts. I'll never forget this. As we came out, now of course, 115 was still a, a pretty good morsel of Davidson Road. When we came out, we got our bikes and we pushed them across the street and we're getting ready to get on them. And some guy pulled up in a pickup at the stoplight, and I can't remember now who it was. He said, What are y'all doing down here? And we said, Well, we came down to get our hair cut. We we're going back home. And he said, Well, do you want to ride? And we said, yeah, but we got our bikes. I said, throw them in the back. So we threw them in the back, and he brought us home, dropped us off at the store right there on Center Street, and uh, Jimmy and I rode home. But uh, we didn't think anything about doing that. I mean, you just didn't hear about young kids being kidnapped, you know, other than, than the Lind Lindberghs. I mean, you know, you didn't hear of that. Uh, I'm sure part of it was because of the news. Has, has grown to a point where, you know, you can't breathe long without somebody sticking a mic and a camera in front of your face and going, well, you know, what happened here? But, uh, you know, I, I remember going across town and, and playing football in uh, my brother Phillip's side yard with his son Stephen and Richard and Bill Bunner from down the street and your brother. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, we just we would go over early in the morning, and I mean, if it got too dark and we had ridden our bikes, then somebody would take us home, or make sure we had flashlights on the bike and a, and a blinking thing where you pedal the bike and, and the tail light would blink. But you know, it, it's just and and we're talking about two and a half miles. I mean, at, at the age of ten years old. I wouldn't let anybody in Charlotte walk out the door. I mean, it's just, it, it's just become such a mega center of humanity that doesn't understand what humanity is really about. A lot of them do, but they're the ones that stay inside. The ones that are out on the street, you never know what's going to happen. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I mean, when I was in Mooresville, I, I never thought about carrying a handgun with me. I am certified for a handgun now, and if you see me, there's probably none within reach. Uh, that's, that's just life in Charlotte now, I mean, and it's become more so all over the country. But... Back in those days, you didn't, you know, I, I never felt threatened. I mean, 
I went to school, I can remember one March, uh, boy, football season was in, and it snowed on a Wednesday. We got something like 10, 12 inches. And, you know, we were out of school a few days. And then we went out one day to practice, and here comes more snowflakes. And three Wednesdays in a row, we ended up with about 20 inches of snow. And I see Larry over there nodding his head. He remembers. But it, it, it was just, you know, every, everybody did what they could. When it snowed in Norseville, oh, it was the greatest time. Everybody took their Coca-Cola signs, sleighs, sleds. Uh, old car. I remember a guy bringing a 44 hood off a of Ford. And we'd all meet at the golf course. And we'd get up at the old reservoir and we'd take that big long hill down. And I remember Jimmy Good and myself and I think Charles Calhoun were in this Ford hood. <laughs> and we start down the hill. It bounced Charles out before we got down that hill. Jimmy and I couldn't get it stopped and the tip of it dipped over in the creek down there. I, where, well, it used to be hole number eight. We went across that fairway. But I mean, you know, it, it was like, it wasn't the three of us, it was like 20 kids. You know, we were all in school together, we all met there. There was never uh, fisticuffs or, uh, yeah, once in a while somebody would get upset with the way you tackled them in the snow or things like that. But it, 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 was, it was just such a great time. But, uh, and the other thing I can remember during heavy snows, uh, mom would go out and rake in snow and cat, it didn't matter whose house you were at, they would make snow cream. It was just so good. And now, I mean, it'd have to snow for a week before I'd be tempted to eat the snow, it, you know. But, uh, you know, I, Miller Drug was right on, in the middle of the block up from John Mack and Sons and at that time, the high school was around the corner, and uh, I remember Delks was on the corner, and they had a, uh, uh, it was a dime store, but they had a, a lunch bar that Dora Blaine ran, and uh, back then in high school, you had your choice. You could go eat in a cafeteria, or you could go out to eat. Well, I mean, you know, t between 12 and 1, when we had our lunch break, you could look at the counter and it was filled with your classmates and uh, then afterwards you would all meet at Miller Drug and it was either just fountain sodas or milkshakes or they would do uh, like chocolate sodas with the, the seltzer water and all and the other thing I remember is on Friday nights uh, after football games we went to the townhouse, and I'm assuming it was either Booster Club or, or Mooresville City Schools paid for our, our dinners because we didn't didn't have dinners. And, the football uh, team, football the team. football team's dinners, yes. And and so we would eat dinner, and of course most of us were tired, and afterwards a few would make the round between Connoisseur and I can't remember the name of the place out where Lotus is now. Joe's Drive. Joe's Drive, and thank you. Uh, and, and and it was like uh, you know, I laugh every time I I hear him in Charlotte talking about what are we going to do with this cruising problem. I grew up with a cruising problem that nobody knew was a problem. <laughs> I mean, you were either at the Connoisseur or you were at Joe's or you were in between or you went home to bed. I mean. There wasn't a lot of places to go. Well, you could go so, to the mall. Do what? You could go to the world mall. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, that's right. They opened it up, but it was, <laughs> see, I'm talking about after a left. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, they, they were closed. But <laughs> anyway, you go home, and then, I mean, half the football team would end up in Miller's Drug on Saturday morning. And we would just sit around and, and drink drinks and, and talk about the game or th up and coming things or 
you know, and, and of course, the city was sort of crazy over the football team, although we weren't a big winning football team back then. But, uh, and, and I mean, you know, Gene Berry made an All-American at Duke. I remember playing against him as a sophomore, and he was a senior. And I, I, it, we used to play these tackling drills where one guy would lay on his back and have to get up and tackle the guy with the ball. And it seemed like I always drew Gene Berry, and I, I would cringe at the thought. But then after you did it, you realized he was so perfect in the way he hit you or tackled you, you didn't feel it. And, and I mean, I was just really proud to see you went on to Duke and became an All-American. Um, to my knowledge, the only All-American from Morrison. Mm -hmm. But uh, you'd see him up there and, and you know, I mean, sophomores and seniors didn't talk hardly. But if you were a football player and he was a senior football player, you had communications because you were on the same team. But, it, it, you know, they had a little status stuff going on. But, I mean, never, it, it, it was just never uh, real radical. I mean, you might not necessarily be in that group or even like most of the people in that group. But you didn't really hate them or dislike them. It was like they've got their little thing to do, we got our little thing to do, and we always did that. And, you know, I mean, I, gosh, Diane Templeton and, and Joy Mills and, and that group were, gosh, two years or three years younger, two years younger than me. But they hung around with us, and, and they became part of our little little thing. And Frank Knox, who who his uncle gave him when when they started filling up Lake Norman, gave him an old house down off of Lane Creek Road, and said, "You can have it. Do whatever you want to." Well, this house had one light bulb in every room, with a pull chain on it. No furniture. The porch had a few places if you stepped wrong, you were about three feet deep into the porch. But funny, and it had a few electrical outlets, not many. But we would go down there and take coolers and soft drinks and beer, and by the way, we were old enough to drink beer at that time. And we would have parties there, and he'd bring a little old record player. Usually, if I remember correctly, it was a 45, or it had a spindle for a 45. And he would stack up all these tunes on that, and we called it the Sugar Shack. And I mean, every Friday or Saturday night that, well, out of football season, because football was on Fridays, we were down there just having a good time enjoying each other. And um, well, it, was, it was just what a great city to grow up in. The schools were good. I mean, when you graduated from Morrisville High School, you could read, write, and, and you knew how to count change, I might add. And, and the reason I bring that up, if you go to any McDonald's and look at their cash register, the keys on their cash register have pictures. If you say, I don't want onions on mine, they hit this button. If they say, I want no cheese on it, they hit this button. If you say, I want it all the way, they hit that button. It absolutely amazes me. Now, this time of my life, most of the people that work in McDonald's speak Spanish. They'll have one, maybe two, uh, that speak both English and Spanish, usually there will be a manager. And the rest of them, you tell them what you want, they've got an ear for what that product is and they get the little buttons. Now, that's not here nor there as, as far as, I mean, I'm hoping all of them are legal immigrants. Uh, because there are a lot of jobs, especially with the economy down, that I think uh, Americans, you know, people say, oh, Americans don't want that job. It doesn't pay but $9 an hour. Well, you know, if you're out of work, I, I know engineers that are working as busboys in restaurants, and they're making seven fifty an hour. 
Now, you can't tell me one of those guys would be too proud to take a $9 job at any place. I, I'm not singling out uh, McDonald's. They all do it. And, and I understand why they do it. I mean, you go to, to the K&W cafeteria, most of the people are, are Spanish. Why? Because they can get them cheap, and they know they can get them cheap, and they can keep them cheap. And if they've got some that are illegal, and they've hired them whether they knew it or didn't know it, the, the illegal immigrants aren't going to say anything. They, they like their job. They're making about six times what they'd be making in Mexico. Well, speaking about jobs, t tell us about working with your dad's company, the wholesale company. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, dad came, as I've said, from a, a group, a family that grew up working. I mean, work was not uh, a strange thing to our family. Uh, at the age of 12, uh, I was illegal to work, but I was a family member. So instead of Dad giving me a quarter, he would say, come work for me, build your hours, I'll pay you. I, th I think he was paying me 15 cents an hour back then. But I would get that paycheck on Thursday when everybody else got a paycheck. And it instilled, from the time long before I could drive, a work ethic. The other thing was the honesty thing. I mean, he didn't ask you a question, and, and if you bent the truth, you better say, well, Dad, I'm not 100% sure on this, because if he found out, you know, <laughs> I laugh today when they say, oh, that lady, they took her kids away because she spanked her kid for really cutting up. That, that was ridiculous. I mean, I, I remember my mom telling my brother and I, if we got too rowdy or whatever, go out and pick your switch. Well, <laughs> you didn't come back with a bad one because then she went out and got it. <laughs> and, and she knew how to use it. But anyway, you, you grew up. I mean, and it wasn't just... My dad, because he, he was the, Phil's kids, Richard and, and Steve, Linda, Laney, all of them, they either worked in the office or they worked out in the warehouse. And, and we would, even before we could drive, we would be sent as a helper to the driver. And I remember, God, this was long before immigration actually set in. I was riding with Robert and uh, Brown, who worked for us. In fact, his wife came over and helped clean the house, so I knew his whole family. But, I mean, I worked with him every, you know, every day, and then on the days he would go to Charlotte, they would put me in the cab with him, and we would go, and we would make this stop, and he'd get up and count out everything, and I'd load it up and take it inside. I mean, we, we just worked together as a team. And I'll never forget, we were over on North Tryon Street, and it was time for lunch. We just delivered to this drive-in, and Robert says, I'm hungry, I want to go ahead and get something to eat here. You go in the front and sit down and get something to eat, and then meet me back here at the truck. And I looked at him and I said, where are you going? You, you said you're hungry. He said, well, I gotta buy mine in the kitchen, and I'll come back and sit in the truck. Well, these were like, May and June days after we'd gotten out of school, I mean, you know, there's no air conditioning in these trucks. So I said, man, if you're going to do that, I'm going to do that. So we went into the kitchen and ordered and paid, went back out and sat, and, and so when integration came along, I mean, I laughed at it. I mean, because in my eyes, I, I didn't see that much difference. I mean, you know, we... We ate together, we worked together, I mean, you know. Um, so, you know, we, we had that. When I got to where I could drive and Steve could drive, they would put us on a truck, and I mean, we would take Phil's routes to Concord on, on, on Saturday. No, no, I'm sorry, on Thursday. And he was, you were supposed to be back around 6 o'clock at night. 
Well, Steve and I would go, and we were following these directions, Phil had given us, and he always took a shortcut here and a shortcut there. Well, you know, you get out past Collar Creek, one shortcut looks like the other shortcut. And we, we would be driving around for hours trying to find this little country store, and what was so bad, he wasn't getting but like fifty dollars worth of stuff. I mean, and back then that was that was a, really not that bad. But Steve and I would come rolling in about seven thirty, eight o'clock, and Phil and my dad would be sitting on the sidewalk waiting to hear that truck pull up. We all did. Well, we've been delivered. Well, what happened? Well, we got lost at this place first, and then we got lost at that place. I mean, it, it was a joke, and we finally got the route down, and, and the trucks we drove, this was, gosh, in the 50s. I was almost graduated high school, so I had to be like 58 or 59. It was a 47 Chevrolet. And I remember pulling up to Lake Lynn Lodge, I'm driving, and Steve's riding shotgun, and we stop and smoke starts billowing out from under the hood. We smell electrical fire. The horn starts <laughs> blowing. The truck's on fire. And we had no clue what to do. Luckily, some guy came out of the and lodge, pulled the horn, and shorted out. But yeah, it was just little things like that that, that you remember. Uh, the good thing is, I, and I feel very lucky, I, I was one of the few that always had a job because, you know, we were right there. And, and I remember guys always going to work for Harris Teeter or uh, the ice cream company or uh, like Johnny Smith and Frank Knox got jobs at uh, John Mackinson and, and uh, Carol, what was the name? Kelly's. Kelly's. Kelly's, that's right. It started out as Kelly. And now John owns the place, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, Smith, uh, yeah. And, and so, I mean, you know, it, we found things that we could actually make, make a living off of after high school. But most of us went to college and um, went on into different things. But at least growing up, we had some spending money that we could do things. And, of course, back then it didn't take a lot. I remember when I was a teenager, or, well, actually, and, yeah, a anywhere from 10 to 15 years old, they would, on Saturday afternoons, we all went to the state theater to the movie. And my dad would give me a quarter. And I would look at him and say, Dad, I'm going to get some. He says, you can do it on that. Well, sure enough, if you'd go, the movie was nine cents. They'd give you change, you went in, you got a, a drink for a nickel, you got a bag of popcorn, you had a penny left over. So on the way back home or down to the store, I would stop at the news center and buy a penny piece of candy, which is no longer in existence now. But yeah, those were just great days. I mean, you know, I, I, I can remember Charlie uh, Newton selling hot dogs on certain nights for a dollar and a quarter, excuse me, for a quarter a piece. You could get five hot dogs for a dollar and a quarter. Steve Mack and I would be working at night, so we would go up about 5.30, eat five hot dogs, <laughs> knock down a big drink, bid Charlie farewell, and go back and work until 10 o'clock that night. Now, granted, we worked most of those hot dogs off, but I mean, you know, we, we were tossing anywhere from 20 to 50 pound boxes and bags and stuff like sometimes up to 100. But, you know, back then, I wish I had this body still, I remember delivering 100 pound bags of sugar to the to Steve and I to the, the ice cream company. And we got there, backed into the alley, had the doors open, pulled two bags down, I took one under one arm and one under one arm and I'd step up on the step that was about a foot high and go in and put them on the stack and then here comes Steve with two. Didn't take us many loads to get 1,500 pounds off the truck. But those are little things. I mean, you know, I, I remember the bootleggers in town that uh, uh, 
I'm not going to mention his name because I think he still has a store out on Stacer Road. <laughs> but he used to come to our store every Saturday afternoon. I'll never forget, he drove a 46 forward, the door opened backwards, and that's why I remember it. He would buy two 100 pound bags of sugar. I mean, this was, it was every Saturday. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, why didn't this guy just get a truck loaded and we'll deliver? It wasn't like that. So one day I asked my brother, Phil, I said, Phil, why does he come down here and buy two 100 pound bags of sugar every week? I mean, why didn't he just come down and buy four and not come back for two weeks? He looked and smiled. He said, fine, he's making moonshine. If he buys 300 pounds of sugar, we have to report him to the ATF. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, are you serious? He said, oh yeah. He said, I said, well how about when we deliver 1,500 pounds to the queen? To the he said, well we turn them in. But they, 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 they aren't worried, they were legitimate operation. So uh, it, that stuff went on, it, it wasn't really uh, talked about a lot, but believe me, when they first voted to put the first liquor store in, my brother was president of the Chamber of Commerce and they had done some studies. You could get a pint of whiskey, of pretty much your choice, delivered to your house in a cab. And everybody's worried about putting a store on the street. I remember hitchhiking home one time from, well, twice, from uh, Pfeiffer College. And I hitchhiked over to, to 29, I got a ride to 29, and I got out and walked up over the guardrail and up the hill, and walked up to, to the old ABC store that was there. And I looked, and back then, Morrisville so had the little tags that said Morrisville on it. There were three cars parked on the side that said Morrisville. I stood in that line of three cars. I said, the first person comes out in one of these cars, I asked for a ride in Morrisville. This man and woman came out and I said, y'all going to Morrisville, would you give me a ride? And they thought and thought and I thought they were going to turn me down. And finally, the guy said, you'll have to, and I didn't know who they were. He said, we don't want you to ever say you saw us over here. <laughs> I said, look, if you would just give me a ride, I, I want to go to the store, Charles Mackins. I said, we know who you are. I, I said, you can drop me off a block from there and I'll walk, but if you just get me to Morrisville. <laughs> and, and so they, they did. And one other time, I got, got in the car with somebody. And again, and this was a younger person. And I can remember when we were talking about the rope sitting out at the connoisseur, now there were probably about eight or nine of us and we all had that big red cup that was full of beer. And you weren't supposed to have beer outside in cans or whatever, you had to take it out in a cup. And I'm talking to one of the guys that's there six days a week, if not seven. <laughs> and we're talking about the vote, and he looks up and says, well, you know, if they bring it to a vote, I, I can't vote for it. And I looked at him and I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, my mom and dad are very against that, and, and I can't vote. And I said, wait a minute. We split bourbon, vodka, we drink beer three, four, five nights a week. And you're telling me you wouldn't go into a, a voting blind and mark a ballot for the liquor store? Uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. And when the vote came, he didn't do that. And Morrison won the vote by 110 votes with all the church bells ringing that day. But I'll never forget that. <laughs> but it's, I think, been a blessing. They have two stores now. I mean, three stores. Oh, that's right, they built one at 33, didn't they? Uh, but here, <clears throat> the other thing I used to do when I was in college, I was old enough to buy whiskey. My brother John and John Holt worked at the golf course. Well, they would call me about 10 o'clock. Frank, can you go to the to China Grave and buy some liquor? Well, yeah, I can. 
They said, well, come by here and we'll get the money up for you. Well, they all wanted pints. They would write out a list. I could only get a gallon. <clears throat> I would drive over there. It, the thing that amazed me was you drive through Iredell County and it, you're on this little secondary paved road. And you hit Cabarrus County, a rolling, it was big wide shoulders, paved black top. You could just roll it right into the liquor store, buy it, turn around and come back. And of course I would take it back to to the uh, golf course and all those guys would come up and tip me two to three bucks. Of course I was using my buds of gas, so it wasn't too bad. How are you? Okay. Fine, be with you in a minute. Uh, sorry about that. That's okay. Do we need to cut it here? Uh, Larry's got a question. Well, uh, you said integration. Did you see any time growing up with being from Lebanese? Did you see any discrimination? Oh. Listen, I, I grew up Lebanese Catholic. Keep, keep going, Frank. And <clears throat> to to it, 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 it was hard to get jobs. <coughs> the people that were a little older than I am, for example, Lib Curry that has a side door. She had two degrees from two outstanding colleges in the United States. Number one, she was Catholic. Number two, she was Lebanese. She could not get a teaching job, and she was more than qualified for some of the people that they hired. Uh, it, it was a, a, both a religious thing and, and a national thing. But, you know, that doesn't really bother me from a national standpoint. Or, or really... From the, from the religious standpoint, uh, we believed in what we believed. My granddaddy went to the First Presbyterian Church every single Sunday, sat in the back pew, got down on his knees, and said a rosary. Okay? His theory was this is God's house. We don't have the kind that we would prefer, but it's still God's house. We will go every Sunday. When Dad came along and, and the family, we got to where we would go to the Presbyterian Church on Sunday school with Steve Mack and, and uh, uh, Philip Mack's family was all Presbyterian. My aunt's family became Methodist. <clears throat> we stayed, remained Catholic, uh, but we went to get a, a Bible education at the Presbyterian Church. Three Sundays, you know, back then travel wasn't easy like it is today. For three Sundays, we would go to the Presbyterian Church. I'm I'm talking about my dad, my mom, my, my brother John, and myself, and <clears throat> we would go to Sunday school and come out for church service. On the other Sunday, we would drive to Charlotte to St. Peter's, which is now Cathedral, in Charlotte, and we would go to church down there. And I'll never forget after church we would meet some of the Lebanese that lived in Charlotte and we would all end up at the Oriental Restaurant which was a block down from the square and you had these little black booths that you know you could put 15 people in there and, and they, would, they would serve you and so uh, you know we made it through all that we were there were two Catholic families when I was in high school uh, it ended up another family moved in. But to start with, our Catholic Church here at St. Therese was a uh, mission of Kamapolis. And they would send a priest over on Sundays. And they would either say Mass in the Van Hoy house up on Church Street, which is a parking lot now, or they would come and say Mass in our house dining room which opened up into you know but there were never more than <clears throat> about 15 people like I was two families and then the Mathesons moved in and Kit and I were the only two in high school and her brother and sister and John were the only two in grade uh, 
junior high and on down. And we just kept growing and growing. The chapel, which is now a Mexican restaurant up on North Main, <coughs> was an old Andrews Air Force Base chapel. The military was going to demolish it and tear it down. They sent out to all the Catholic churches, if you want one of these chapels, we'll take it apart. You have to come get it. My dad sent three of his trucks to, to Maryland, and they brought this concrete block. They brought the beams back. They brought the first stained glass windows back. They were just one opaque color. They brought back uh, the pews, and then some of the local people here painted and built and put it together. And I remember my mom doing went in the war memorial and doing spaghetti dinners. And I, I remember one winter that's how we paid for heat at the church. We weren't a big enough congregation, and uh, we kept growing. And now, from what I understand. There's over 15 to 1,700 Catholic families registered to this church. They're building a new sanctuary. Yeah, oh, I knew that. And uh, it, it's a lot of it is racing. All these people, and not, not just racing, northern companies that have moved south. Charlotte, I mean, St. Matthew's Church in Charlotte is the largest Catholic church in the state of North Carolina. I mean, I went there one time, I, I could barely walk. It was Palm Sunday night. I was walking without crutches, but I, it was hard for me to stand. I got there early, I sat down in the back pew, and a lot of people were in there, and, and an usher comes in and says, everybody's got to come outside for the blessing of the palms. I got up and went out. Well, when I came back, there was three deep standing at the back of the church. Mm. It was all I could do to do it. But, I mean, that's how big they've gotten. But, <clears throat> that, you know, I didn't notice uh, when I came along a, a lot of uh, national nationality uh, uh, problems with, you know, we don't want you around or whatever. Now, hey, there were some that were a little, little more less forgiving than others. But, I mean, that, you know, I, I, it, it just never really bothered me. Yeah. And, and, I mean, I, in fact, I used to tell people in Charlotte, because they were having all these problems with, you know, this black person going to school and they didn't want them. And, you know, but when Louisville integrated, the smartest thing they ever did was the modernized wood school, which used to be all black from kindergarten, 12th grade, I believe. They moved all this one certain grade to the high school, one to the junior high, and this one had all of two grades or three grades. And if you were in that grade, that's where you went to school. It, it, they did away with white schools and black schools. And, and I think Mooresville had less transition, and I may be wrong, but less transition than, especially cities larger by, by all means. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you, you just didn't think about stuff like that if, if unless it was really worrisome. And, and, you know, I, I, I remember people saying, oh, we need to go do this and we need to go th do that. And what it ended up being is some loud mouth running in his mouth, and it never really happened. And, and uh, I, overall, I mean, it, it, growing up in Mosul was a godsend. Well, thank you, Frank. I think the family is wanting to talk with you. Well, so we need to stop here. I know you okay. can keep on telling uh, stories. Uh, uh, that's, listen, when Samantha takes me to the doctor, she's going, Dad, <laughs> cut it off. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yes. You brought up something that I forgot about. I worked at Duke Power during